Welcome once again to the fifth and final part of this Sabbath Enrichment Seminar. In the previous four presentations, Dr. Bakayoki has helped us to understand more fully how to appreciate and to keep the Sabbath in order to experience mental, physical, and spiritual renewal. This last presentation differs from the previous ones because it deals with the historical change from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. In today's presentation, Dr. Bakayoki hopes to do the impossible, to squeeze five years of research done in the Vatican archives in Rome, Italy, into one hour lecture. It promises to be a very informative presentation, to say the least. Once again, here's Dr. Samuel Bakayoki. Welcome, friends, to our final session of our Sabbath Enrichment Seminar. In the previous four presentations, I shared with you, first of all, the story of the Sabbath in my life, how the Lord opened the door for me to enter, study, research, and publish the Sabbath of all places inside the Vatican. Then we explored a little bit the meaning of the Sabbath, how on, this, how on and through the Sabbath we can serve God, ourselves, and others. We also uh, discovered that through the Sabbath, we can experience the presence, the peace and the rest of Christ in our life in a very special way. And then in the fourth presentation, I gave you an update report on the latest Sabbath Sunday development. We have seen how the Sabbath is being attacked on one hand and yet being rediscovered in an unprecedented way by Christians of all persuasion today. In this final presentation, I want to share with you the highlight of the research which I did in Rome at the Pontifical Gregorian University on the change of the Sabbath. The title of my lecture is really the title of my dissertation, From Sabbath to Sunday, How It Came About. I did this investigation in Rome at the Pontifical Gregorian University. For those who may not know it, the Gregoriana, as it is known, is the most prestigious Jesuit university in the world. It has been the alma mater of all the popes, cardinal, bishops, of the Roman Catholic Church. Even the present Pope is a graduate of the Gre Gregoriana. It was founded by Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit movement in 1551. Now, some of you may be wondering, Dr. Bacchiocchi, or call me Brother Sam if you prefer, much easier. What made you decide to go and study there in Rome at the Gregoriana? My answer is rather simple. I was hoping that if the Lord would open the door for me to study there at such a prestigious Vatican University, that I may have access to the various Vatican library, Vatican archives, and found revealing documents, documents showing the role of the papers in changing the Sabbath to Sunday. After all, this is what we believe. Prophetically, we understand that the little horn was responsible for changing times and law, and we see this as a reference to the power of the papacy to change God's law. And uh, I was very eager to see if I could find a documentation that could give historical support to our prophetic interpretation. And the reason why I was so eager to, to undertake this research is because, as I have told you in my previous presentation, the Sabbath has been a testing truth in my life. I faced considerable problems for Sabbath keeping in my youth, you know, problem for missing school on Saturday, the principal of, of the secondary school would tell my mother that if I would be absent for three consecutive Saturday without medical excuse, I would be expelled from school. And I vividly recall my godly mother taking me to the family doctor every week. And the doctor was very helpful. He would prepare a very funny medical excuse, say that Sam Bakyoki on such and such a Saturday was psychologically incapacitato. My mind went out of order. I became psychologically incapacitated. I could function during the week, but no longer on the Sabbath. And the principal accepted it because it was prepared by a doctor. I remember the problem I had with the Catholic priest. He would come twice a week to teach us 
il catechismo cattolico, the Catholic catechism, when he learned that I was not a Catholic, a protestante adventista, adventist protestant, he told everybody, Sam Bacchiocchi sitting down there is a protestant heretical, heretical protestant, keep away from him, keep away from him. And that's exactly what they did. Whenever I approached them to strike conversation with them, say, stay lontano, keep away from us, tu sei un heretico, you are a heretic, tu sei un judeo, you are a Jew. I remember it so well because it broke my heart. I was a teenager. I longed to be accepted by my friends. And when I found that I was rejected, I used to go home heartbroken, crying, Mama, Papa, don't send me to school anymore. Everybody hates me at school. I remember my godly father looking me straight into my eyes and saying, Samuele, you stand up for what you know to be God's truth. God will honor your commitment. And this is the challenge I'd like to pass on to all of us, that if we stand up for what we know to be God's truth, sometimes we may have to suffer ridicule, rejection, persecution, but ultimately the Lord will honor our commitment. And it was because of all of these challenges I faced as a young fellow that I started dreaming. I said, you know, someday, if the Lord is going to give me this opportunity, I want to investigate which is God's holy day and what it should mean to our Christian life today. I felt that if I had to suffer, I wanted to be sure that I was suffering for the sake of a biblical truth, not for the sake of a denominational tradition. And my dream came true on July 1977 when I stood inside the Vatican Press and I watched my doctoral dissertation rolling off the Vatican Press with the official stamp of the Vatican, the papal tiara and the cross key, and the official imprimatur. This is the only book that the Vatican has ever published with their official stamp of approval, though it is written by a non-Catholic. And I hasten to say, that they have regretted the day they have allowed this to happen. As I mentioned in a previous presentation, this research has generated so much controversy in those dominant Catholic countries of Central and South America that they have taken certain measure. First of all, they have removed the book from circulation and they even have told my beloved professor, Vincenzo Monachino, who guided me for five years in my research, never to talk with me anymore. For Folks, I like to thank God for the privilege of working at the feet of such a godly man, a man of a high intellectual stature, a man that was willing to encourage the inquiry into truth. He knew that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. He knew the risk that he was taking by allowing me to do this research, but God gave him the courage to take the risk. And I tell you, I only feel sorry that he had to suffer for me. I'll tell you in a moment what has happened to him. I also like to express my gratitude to Pope Paul VI for granting me this beautiful gold medal for earning the academic distinction of summa cum laude. On the front side is the picture of the Pope. On the back side, he portrays a shepherd, the lamb, the flock, and the new Jerusalem. He portrays the Pope as the great shepherd of the flock, leading God's people to the city of God. I view this gold medal not as a personal triumph, but as the triumph of truth the triumph of our mission today, to proclaim the good news of the Sabbath to our tension-filled and restless society. And as I was mentioning a moment ago, my research has generated so much controversy that ultimately the Pontifical Gregorian University was forced to take three measures. Number one, they confiscated my book. They removed it from circulation. Fortunately, the Lord gave me the foresight. I could smell smoke. I could tell it that it was coming because of all of these letters of investigation I was receiving from Argentina, from Brazil, from Venezuela. Many of these Catholic leaders were trying to find out oh, who directed my dissertation, who was responsible for the imprimatur, how the publishing came about. And when I started receiving all of this inquiring, investigative letter, I said, you know, I better go to Rome. I better go to Rome and buy the copyright. So I made a special trip. I spoke with the, with the director of the, uh, the, the Pontifical Gregorian University Press. I asked how much it would cost me to compensate them for all the investment that they did 
in publishing the, and, and uh, typesetting my dissertation. They told me $5,000. He thought I would never pay for that. I was prepared for it. I wrote them a check of $5,000. I gave it to them, and they gave me the copyright, and I'm surely glad that I did it. Otherwise, they would have prevented the circulation of this book. And now I'm the one supplying it to all the Catholic institutions around the world. They're all contacting me, like Notre Dame University. I order about 25 copies every year for their class on early Christian liturgy. My professor was given clear directing that he should never have a contact with me anymore. He used to receive with open arms. Every time I went to Rome, I always paid him a special visit and I brought him a gift from America. But then he was instructed by the general of the Jesuit order, Father Arupe, that he should not talk to me anymore. He was dying in his deathbed in the critical care unit of the hospital a year ago when I was in Rome. I asked if I could see him for the last time. They told me the instruction was that I should not make an attempt to visit him. Otherwise, I would be thrown out by force. So I didn't even try. And lastly, the door of the university was closed. I was the first non-Catholic. After Vatican II, when the decision was made to allow separated bread, I was the first one to take advantage of it, and I'm also the last one, because the work that I have done has generated so much controversy that they don't want to take the risk anymore. So i just like to thank God. I want to express my gratitude to God for his providential leading for opening the door for me to do this investigation, which has helped countless Christians around the world. As I travel around the world, I meet people that already know me through my research. When I was in Singapore just two months ago, the bishop of the Anglican Cathedral, very nice gentleman, had ordered my book through the website. He has accepted the Sabbath, shared with the congregation, and he said, you know, I wish you could stay one more week and preach to my congregation because you could help them to understand and experience this Sabbath more fully. I was in Japan, the same story. You know, there is power in the printed page. Over 200 clergymen in the last couple of years have accepted the Sabbath as a result of the circulation of the printed page. Now, let us come to the lecture. I wanted to give a little bit of a background because I noticed there's a number of new people visiting us today. Now, the change from Sabbath to Sunday has been hotly debated in Christian history. Would you believe it? Over 3,000 treaties have been written since the time of the Reformation debating the Sabbath-Sunday question. Truly, we can say that the Sabbath has had no rest. There has been no rest for the Sabbath. The question is, why is the Sabbath so controversial? Why is it that of all the Ten Commandments, only the Fourth Commandment has been disputed? You know, I'm not aware of doctoral dissertation challenging the validity of the other nine commandments. Only the fourth commandment has been under the crossfire of controversy. Why? Let me suggest two reasons. One is an existential reason. The Sabbath summons us to consecrate our time to God. And people are very touched about their time. People want to use their time to seek for pleasure, for, to seek for profit, not necessarily to seek for the presence and peace of God in their life. So basically, the Sabbath is controversial because it challenges us to be God-centered in a very self-centered society. Are you with me? A second reason why the Sabbath is controversial, because historically, the um, church leaders have been divided on the relationship between the Sabbath and Sunday. There have been two positions that have been adopted. One is the Calvinistic position and the other is the Catholic Lutheran position. The Calvinistic tradition views Sunday as the continuation of the Sabbath. For the Calvinist, uh, Sunday began as the continuation of the Sabbath and consequently Sunday keeping is the keeping of the Christian Sabbath. Like here in Grand Rapids, for example, we have the, uh, the um, what we call it, the Christian Reform Reformed Church, Presbyterian churches, and many of these churches that even Baptist churches that come from a, uh, from a Calvinistic tradition, they like to think of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. But the Catholic and the Lutheran have adopted a different position. For the Catholic and the Lutheran, Sunday began not as the continuation of the Sabbath, but as a different day 
radically different from the Sabbath. In fact, Sunday began as the hour of the Mass for the Catholic and the hour of the proclamation of the Word for the Lutheran. For them, the focus is not on the day, but on church attendance, on fulfilling what the Catholic call the Mass precept. Now, what is amazing, however, this is, by the way, has been the historical Catholic position. Uh, the Catholics have always affirmed that Sunday keeping is their own ecclesiastical institution. Thomas Aquinas, the most influential Catholic theologian, notice what he says in Summa Theological, which is the, is the scaffolding of Catholic theology. Notice what he says in the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not to by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the church. So without, uh, without any hesitation, the Catholic Church has always admitted, we, the Catholic Church, have been responsible for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. And you can find many historical documents affirming this position. But in recent time, there have been changes. Uh, the Catholics and even the Lutheran are attempting to justify Sunday observance no longer as a Catholic institution, but as a biblical institution. We discussed this in the previous lecture on the Sabbath and the crossfire, where we uh, looked at this famous pastoral letter, Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where the Pope makes a passionate plea for a revival of Sunday keeping by proclaiming Sunday to be the biblical Sabbath. He says, for example, Sunday is the day of rest because it's a day blessed by God, made holy by Him, set apart from the other day to be among them the Lord's day. Have you ever read that in your Bible? That God blessed the Sunday, made it holy, set it apart as the Lord's day. What is the Pope doing, folks? He's taking those biblical references to the Sabbath and applies them to Sunday so that people may come to view Sunday not as something that was created by the Catholic Church, but is something that is rooted in the most uh, authoritative uh, 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 more code that was ever given to mankind, the Decalogue. And, you know, in, in Europe, for many years, they have promoted this deception that Sunday is the seventh day. And now it's starting in America as well. You know, in Europe, all the calendar give Monday as the first day and Sunday as the seventh day. But this is happening in this country as well. For example, I bought this from Christianity Today. I, I keep this because this is 1985, which shows that it has been going on for some years already. Notice what it says here. God, seventh day, is what? Sunday. This is a deception. Don't you think so? They are trying to persuade the people to observe Sunday uh, as if it was the biblical Sabbath. The goal, basically, is to promote Sunday observance no longer as a Catholic institution, but as a biblical institution rooted and grounded in the Sabbath commandment. Now, may I ask, if Christians are expected to observe Sunday as the biblical Sabbath, why shouldn't they observe the Sabbath itself in the first place? What is wrong with the biblical Sabbath? You follow me? It means that it's a very, very what shall I say, irrational to promote Sunday as the biblical Sabbath while at the same time trying to negate the validity of the Sabbath. That doesn't make sense. You follow me? Well, to apply the Sabbath to Sunday is very, is, is very confusing. This is why I believe there are many Christians who don't take Sunday keeping very seriously because they don't find any biblical mandate for observing Sunday as a holy day. Now, let me tell you what, what have been the objective of my research. My, the goal of my investigation was to establish the time, the place, the causes, and the consequences of the change from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. And let me state immediately my conclusion at the outset, so then as we go through step by step, you already know where we are aiming at. The conclusion of my investigation is that the change from Sabbath to Sunday came about not by the authority of Christ, not by the authority of the Apostle, not because of the desire to honor Christ's resurrection on the first day of the week, but as a result of an interplay of social, pagan, political factor. 
three major factors, I would say. Anti-Judaism, as you will see, influenced the abandonment of the Sabbath. Pagan sun worship influenced the adoption of Sunday. And the major role was played by the Bishop of Rome, all of whom, in their own way, promoted the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. In a little while, I'm going to tell you some of the measures that were adopted by the Bishop of Rome to win people away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. Now, the implication of my research is that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was not just a change of names or of number, but was a change of authority, a change of meaning, a change of experience. Indeed, it was a change from a holiday into a holiday. Now, let me tell you how I have divided my dissertation. Would you believe it? In a few moments this morning, I'm taking through the whole, uh, the whole dissertation step by step. I'm going to give you the gist, the summary, the highlight of, every, of all the five major parts of my research. I started my investigation with Christ and the origin of sand, and you will see why in a moment. Then I proceeded to examine the claim of the resurrection and the origin of Sandy. Then I proceeded to, to investigate the alleged role of the Jerusalem church in changing the Sabbath to Sunday. And then I moved in in the study of the Church of Rome and the origin of Sunday. And finally, sun worship and the origin of Sunday. So these are the five major parts of my research, which i like to share share with you very briefly this morning. First, Christ and the origin of Sunday. In recent times, a number of scholars have argued that Christ paved the way for the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. This perhaps is the most authoritative scholarly work that has been produced. Seven British American scholars work together as a combined doctoral project there at the University of Cambridge in England and produce what is considered to be the most scholarly defense of Sunday keeping. And this professor, I know several of them, by the way, I corresponded with them. Some of them told me that after reading my research, which I sent them, had to rewrite their chapter. In fact, they quote me over a hundred times, and many times they give me credit. But in some places they want to take issue with me, and they, are, they have the right to do it, but their position, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is very undefensible. For example, they argue that Christ, by his provocatory method of Sabbath keeping, which irritated you know, the, the, the religious authority of the time, he was paving the way for the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. So they don't claim that Jesus changed the Sabbath to Sunday, but by attacking the Sabbath, he, they say he was uh, opening the door for the adoption of Sunday keeping. How will we respond to this claim? Well, Christ's controversial Sabbath healing and Sabbath controversy were designed not to nullify but to clarify the divine intent of the Sabbath. Isn't it true? You know, whenever Christ was accused of Sabbath breaking, he never accepted that accusation. He refuted it by saying what? Haven't you read about David? Haven't you read about the priests that they work on the Sabbath and yet they are guiltless? In other words, what I'm doing is according to the scripture. You are upset with me because you don't understand the meaning of the Sabbath, the divine intent of the Sabbath. Remember, there are seven Sabbath healing episodes on the gospel. By the way, there is more coverage given to the Sabbath teaching, to the Sabbath ministry of Jesus than to any other aspect of his ministry. And yet there are some people who cannot find the Sabbath in the New Testament. When I spoke there in Atlanta, Georgia, to 150 religious just leader, one gentleman asked me, where do you find the Sabbath in the New Testament? I said, friend, you must be blind. There is more coverage given to the Sabbath teaching, to the Sabbath ministry of Jesus than to any other aspect of his ministry. What did Jesus say about the Sabbath? Jesus said that the Sabbath is the day to do good. Jesus said the Sabbath is the day to save. Jesus said the Sabbath is the day to liberate men and women from physical and spiritual bond. Jesus said that the Sabbath is a day of mercy. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for our human benefit. When we study all the Sabbath pronouncements of Jesus, it's abundantly clear that Jesus never intended to nullify the Sabbath, but to reaffirm it, and he wanted indeed 
to come to see the Sabbath as the celebration, not only of God's creative, but also of God's redemptive love. When you look, for example, how Jesus began his ministry, proclaiming to be the Sabbath liberator, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to preach good news of the poor, release to the captive, liberty to those are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the acceptable year of the Lord was the sabbatical year, the year when the Sabbath became the liberator of the Hebrew society. And what did Jesus say? Luke 4, 21, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And when you read the whole Sabbath ministry of Jesus, you notice how on the Sabbath, Jesus brought physical and spiritual liberation to needy people. Why? Because he wanted the Sabbath to be remembered, not only as the day to celebrate God's creative love, but also God's redemptive love. Let us move on to the resurrection and the original sending. As you know, this is a very popular view. I'm sure that whenever you talk with your Christian friends, they will tell you that they observe Sunday in honor of Christ's resurrection, which took place on the first day of the week. We know I discovered this position as soon as I got there at the Gregoriana. I had just enrolled. I started attending school. I went to, to school very early one morning to find the parking place, and I had two hours to wait for the first class, so I spent the time in the hallway looking at the latest publication which were exhibited on, uh, along these uh, panels of the wall. And I saw a newly published dissertation, Storia della Domenica, from the beginning to the fifth century, in Italian. I went to the bookstore immediately, bought a copy, and for the next several months, I used every spare moment to examine very carefully, analytically, this dissertation. And I was surprised to see how the author, this Jesuit scholars who had just earned his doctorate by defending this dissertation, makes the claim, for example, that we can conclude with certainty, he says, that the event of the resurrection has determined the choice of Sunday as the new day of rest and worship. So this is a very popular position that is being defended by Catholic and Protestant scholars today. The question is, did Christ's resurrection on the first day of the week really influence the change from Sabbath to Sunday in the Apostolic Church? My answer is no. And let me give you seven reasons. And uh, you may not have to write everything now because eventually you can get a copy of all of this uh, recording and so you can look it over again at your, uh, at your convenience. Let me mention seven reasons which discredit the role of the resurrection in, in the adoption of Sunday Observer. Number one, there is no command in the New Testament regarding a weekly Sunday or annual Easter Sunday celebration of the resurrection. We have a command for baptism. We have a command for the Lord's Supper. We have a command for foot washing. But we find that Jesus and the apostle gave no instruction, no injunction regarding the celebration of the resurrection. Number two, Jesus made no attempt to institute a memorial of his resurrection. This is very important. Folks, let me ask you, if Jesus wanted the day of his resurrection to become a memorial day, don't you think that on the day when he arose, on that Easter Sunday morning, he would have invited the women first, the disciples later, to come apart and celebrate my resurrection? After all, all the biblical institutions, the Sabbath, Baptist, Lord's Supper, foot washing, all of them trace their origin to a divine act that established them. Are you with me? And don't you think that if Jesus wanted his, the day of his resurrection to become a memorial day, he would have done something about it. Number three, which is very important, Sunday is never called the day of the resurrection. In the New Testament, nor in the early Christian literature. If you were to read this doctoral dissertation done there in Washington, D.C. at the Catholic University of America, Francis Regan, in chapter 4 of his dissertation, begins lamenting that unfortunately Sunday is not designated as the day of the resurrection in the documents of the first fourth century. Why? Because the association was not as yet clearly established. Are you with me? Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. The resurrection is very fundamental to the Christian faith. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that if Christ is not risen, our hope, our faith, our preaching, everything is in vain. The resurrection is very fundamental to the Christian faith. 
but in the New Testament it is celebrated not liturgically by the day of rest and worship, but existentially by living by the power of the risen Savior. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3.10. He says that I pray that I may know the power of the resurrection, not the day of the resurrection. Uh, fact number five. The Lord's Supper was not celebrated on Sunday in honor of Christ's resurrection in the primitive church. Why do I mention this? Because some scholars argue that Sunday became the Lord's day because that was the day in which the Lord's Supper was celebrated. This is the position of Willy Rordorf in Switzerland, in Basel, a professor at the University of Basel, whose doctoral dissertation was the major work until the new symposium came out recently. And I have interacted with Rordorf when I was over there in Switzerland some time ago. I even contacted him. We had a very pleasant conversation. Shall I tell you what? With real scholars, you can have a pleasant conversation. The problem sometimes is when I have to deal with ignorant people who know very little, then they are very arrogant. Do you know why? Because ignorance breeds arrogance. Did you know that? Ignorance breeds arrogance. But when you deal with real scholar, you can have a very pleasant dialogue. And shall I tell you what Willy Rolfo did? He in his, in, the, in his Italian edition of his dissertation, in the introduction, he wrote a beautiful um, recommendation of my work and he urges reader uh, to read my dissertation in order to rectify, he says, some of his conclusion. Mamma mia, to have a scholar uh, at the introduction of a foreign edition of his dissertation urging people to read another book, in this case my own book, uh, in order to rectify his position. That already tells the people there are mistakes here. Be careful when you read. You follow me? There's only a big scholar who can do that. Don't you think so? But what this uh, professor what is arguing in this dissertation, that the fact that the Lord Supper was celebrated on Sunday, Sunday became the Lord's Day. You know what I did? I made a historical investigation to find out when was the Lord's Supper celebrated in early Christianity. And you know what I found? There was no specific time. Why? Because it was prohibited by Roman law. It was this evening supper meeting were seen as a kind of political plotting. And so in order to escape the search of the Roman police, the Christian would change time, would change place. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, four times he says, when you come together, when you come together, which day was that? Indefinite, because once it may be a Monday in a home, next month it may be Tuesday in another home, by changing place, changing time, they were trying to avoid the search of the Roman police. Fact number six, in the New Testament, baptism, not Sunday, enables the believer to participate in the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. And the last reason I like to mention that the resurrection is not the dominant reason for Sunday keeping in the earliest document. You know, the earliest document that go back to the second century give us the first reason for Sunday keeping, for observing the dear solis, the day of the sun, the fact that on the first day of creation, God created the light. We are going to come back to that in a moment. You may say, what, what, what kind of reasoning is that? Well, it doesn't make any sense to us because we could all, then we could observe any day because, because every day God created created something. But you see, since they, were, uh, since they had adopted the, the day of the sun, they saw the correlation between the day of the sun and the creation of the light. So they tried to justify Sunday observance initially by saying that we observe the day of the sun because on that day the light was created. But eventually that reason was dropped because it's rather senseless, as you can understand. So Christ's resurrection is by all means fundamental to the Christian faith, but it played no significant role in the change of Sabbath to Sunday because the resurrection, as I told you before, was celebrated existentially by living victoriously by the power of the risen Christ and not liturgically on a weekly Sunday or annual Easter Sunday. Now, we want to discuss for a few moments Jerusalem and the origin of Sunday. Why? Because the popular view is that the Apostolic Church of Jerusalem was responsible for pioneering the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. This view is based on three faulty assumptions. First of all, 
they argue that Christian immediately after Pentecost sends the need uh, to uh, honor Christ's resurrection on a, uh, on a special Christian day, Sunday, and also in a special Christian place, the church. The assumption is that there was a radical break immediately at Pentecost when these uh, Christian thousands believed and accepted Jesus of Nazareth as their expected Messiah, they immediately felt the need to separate from the Jews. They felt, so to speak, when they went to the synagogue, they felt like fishes out of water. They were not comfortable anymore. So they needed a new place, they needed a new day to give expression to their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. That is the prevailing assumption, which is totally wrong totally unfounded, and I'm glad that many scholars are finally recognizing it. Why? Because the Jerusalem church was composed of believing Jews. And these believing Jews are described as being zealous in the observance of the law. I remember the day when I went to see my professor, discussing with him Acts 21, 20, where James says to Paul, you see, brother Paul, how many thousands there are of the Jews who have believed, and they are all zealous in the observance of God's law. I told my professor, do you think that if they were zealous in the observance of the law, they would have taken the initiative to abandon one of the chief precepts of the law and substituting it, you know, the Sabbath with Sunday? You know what he said. Some, this is something to think about. This is something to think. This was my strategy, always to give him something to think about. You follow me? I wanted to gain by points, gradually acceptance, you know. Folks, let me tell you something. I wish I had more time. I have to be very brief. But let me tell you, a, a, a prevailing misconception has been for many centuries that Christianity began as a radical breakaway from Judaism, which is utterly untrue. The earliest Christians that believed on the day of Pentecost, the 3,000, then 5,000, then multitude of the priests, and James says, media that believed, apparently almost half of the city of Jerusalem believed. What did they believe? Did they believe the 27 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Obviously not. What did they believe? They believed that Jesus of Nazareth was their expected Messiah. What did they become? Did they become Christian? The word Christian didn't even exist until later on. It was coined by the Romans in Antioch when they heard these people talking about Christos, Christos, so they nicknamed them Christianoi, from which we get the word Christian. What did they believe? <coughs> they believed that Jesus of Nazareth was their expected Messiah. And by accepting Jesus of Nazareth as their expected Messiah, they became believing Jews. The tension in the book of Acts is not between Christian and and Jews between believing Jews and unbelieving Jews. Are you with me? Now, the second assumption is that only the Jerusalem church had sufficient authority, you know, to change the Sabbath to Sunday, because after all, that was the mother church of Christendom. That is true. The Jerusalem church had the authority, but not the desire to change the Sabbath to Sunday. Why? Because they were deeply committed to the observance of the law in general and of the Seventh-day Sabbath in particular. The third assumption is that the absence of any Sabbath Sunday controversy between Paul and the Jerusalem church implies that uh, Paul accepted Sunday keeping as taught him by Jerusalem church. Well, my response is that the absence of any controversy suggests that, there was, that uh, the observance of the Sabbath never became an issue. You remember that when Paul, you know, challenged uh, the circumcision, the desire of the Jerusalem church to have the Gentiles circumcised, there was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. The Jerusalem brethren follow, sent people to follow Paul, you know, spies to follow Paul like a shadow. But we have no indication of any controversy about the Sabbath, obviously, because this became, never became an issue. The most telling, histor telling and compelling historical evidence of the continuity of Sabbath keeping is this testimony of Epiphanius. I remember the day when I found this document there in this uh, Vatican archive. I was jubilant. I jumped for joy. 
I jumped too high and I banged my head and I became bald as a result of it. If you were wondering how did I get a shining top, it was out of excitement in the Vatican archive. What does Epiphanius tell us? Epiphanius, who lived in the middle of the fourth century, 350, he gives the history of the Jerusalem church, how the Christian prior to the AD, AD 70 destruction, you know, migrated up to Pella, colonized the place, and he tells us that this direct descendant that became known as the Nazarene insisted and persisted in the observance of the Sabbath until his own time. When I went to show this document to my professor, he couldn't believe it. Where did you find this? I said, Professor, it was right here in your archive. I did not bring it from America for sure. And after reading the Latin and the Greek column, he said, Samuele, questo è il certificato di morte. This is the death certificate of the theory that makes Sandy the birthplace that make Jerusalem the birthplace of Sunday keeping. The conclusion is that the Jerusalem church did not change the Sabbath to Sunday because of all the churches, it was the most deeply committed church to the observance of God's law in general and of the Sabbath in particular. The birthplace of Sunday observer must be sought in an influential Gentile church which had no significant Jewish religious roots. And this led me to the to the investigation of the possible role of the Church of Rome and the origin of Sandy. And I found seven significant indications pointing to the Church of Rome as the birthplace of Sunday keeping. Number one, the Church of Rome was composed mostly of Gentile converts, while the Jerusalem Church was made up of believing Jews. The Church of Rome was made up mostly of converts from paganism, you know, from Gentiles. Notice Paul himself says, I'm writing to you Gentiles, number one. Number two, I found that the Church of Rome early separated from the Jews. You remember at the time of the Emperor uh, Nero, when the Emperor in 64 AD blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, even though the Jewish district of Trastevere was not even touched by the fire, the Jews were never suspected, obviously because Nero had married a Jewish princess, Popea Sabina, but by 64 AD we have clear indication that the Christian community was clearly, distinctly separated from the Jews. This did not happen in Palestine. At the end of the first century, there were still Christian attending the synagogue, and the rabbinical authority had to introduce the Berka Hamin, the malediction of the Christian in their synagogue prayer, so that if Christians were present, they would have to curse themselves, and that was a way to keep them out of the synagogue. Number three, I found that in Rome, the bishop became very influential, very dominant after the destruction of Jerusalem. The, the, the center of the Christian authority transferred from Jerusalem to Rome. Rome, the capital empire, became also, so to speak, the headwater of the Christian church. And this Roman uh, bishop, like Sixtus and Victor, not only introduced Sunday observance, but also legislated about it, as we are going to see in a moment. Then point four is that the Roman at that time imposed repressive fiscal, military, political, and religious measure upon the Jews. Why? Because the Jews were uprising. They were rebelling everywhere. As long as they were obedient and paying taxes, Judaism was religious, legitimate, lawful religion, protected by Roman law. But once they started uprising because the Jews were experiencing a resurgent messianic expectation, they thought the time had come for them to throw off the yoke of Roman domination and to regain their national independence. This period between 60 to 135 AD is one of the most turbulent periods of Jewish history. And so they were uprising everywhere. And all of a sudden we find that the Romans had to adopt special measures. One of them was the Fiscus Judaicus. If you were a Jew, you were taxed. You had to pay an extra tax of 20% because you were a Jew. Now, how would you like to pay, you know, a tax for being a Seventh-day Adventist, you know? And there are very interesting stories of this fiscal agent knocking at the door of Christians, expecting them to pay this uh, fiscus judaicus and this Christian, I'm not a Jew, you are a Jew, I'm not a Jew, you are a Jew. And they grabbed one, uh, Suetonius tells us a Roman historian, they grabbed the Christian, 92 years of age, they brought him to the court, and the judge asked him to undress himself 
enough to show that he was not circumcised. And the historian says it was not a glorious sight to see a 92-year, 92-old man to have to do this kind of what you call this tricking, you know, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, undressing in a crowded court. But I try to reconstruct the social condition that created this necessity to change the Sabbath to Sunday. And because the Jews were repressed, then Roman intelligentsia, author like Seneca, Plutarch, and Tacito began reviving the, reviving the Jews. It's amazing how often uh, church theologian will develop a theology to justify political and social practices. This happened in America in the 19th century when slavery existed. You will find theologians were trying to find a biblical reason to justify justify slavery. You follow me? And it's happening today when the feminist theology that does away with the role distinction between men and women has influenced many theologians to show that there is no distinction. There is no principle of headship and submission and so forth. It's amazing how many times theology has been conditioned by prevailing social and political agenda. And the Jewish people were accused of what? Of being a lazy people, of wasting their one-seventh of their life, it was, they said in idleness because you observe the Sabbath, they were accused of being a lazy bunch of people. You follow me? And, but the most important and decisive factor was the Hadrianic legislation. The Emperor Hadrian in 135 AD promulgated the most repressive anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath legislation, outlawing not only the practice of Judaism in general, but of seven days Sabbath keeping in particular. This is the article that appeared there in the Biblical Archaeology Review where I discussed this Hadrianic legislation. The finding of this documentation was very pivotal to my research because I was really looking for a major event that would have caused, you know, church leader and Christian in general to consider the possibility of abandoning the Sabbath. And I found that when this Roman anti-Sabbath legislation was promulgated because this Roman emperor Hadrian had to fight a bloody warfare for three years from 132 to 135, the so-called Bar Kokhba revolt to capture Jerusalem, suffering great casualty when he finally took Jerusalem and said, this is it. Hitler said, let's liquidate the Jews. Hadrian said, let's liquidate Judaism as a religion. How? By abolishing the Sabbath. And it was in that critical moment when Sabbath keeping was prohibited by Roman law that some of the Christians said, hey, why should we suffer? for being uh, associated with the Jews. Why don't show separation identification uh, with the pagans, rather separation from the Jews, identification with the pagans? Well, we are coming back to that in a moment, but this also contributed to the, theo to the developing of a theology of contempt for the Jews that we want to discuss in a moment. Let me mention quickly three specific measures that were taken by the Bishop of Rome to win people away from Sabbath keeping into Sabbath and the keeping. Number one, theological measure. Here you have the picture of Justin Martyr, one of the leaders of the Church of Rome in 150, the middle of the second century. If you were to read what he wrote about the Sabbath, you would have the shock of your life. You know what he wrote? He said the Sabbath was given to the Jews. Why? Because they are a murderous people. They have murdered the prophets. They have murdered Christ. They deserve to be punished. And God has given them the Sabbath as the trademark of their depravity. Mamma mia! When I read that, I got the shock treatment of my life. And what bothers me is that no scholars who examine Justin Martyr dare to condemn him for this theology of contempt toward the Jews. But, you know, this whole idea was the Sabbath is Jewish, trademark of Jewish depravity, we Christians don't want to identify ourselves with the Jews. Then socially I found that some of the Roman bishops, for example, the Bishop Sylvester, he lived at the time of Constantine, he decreed, I found the papal decretal, that Christians were uh, to fast on the Sabbath, not to feast, because the Sabbath was a joyful day, and, uh, it was a day of celebration, and in order to kill the festive gleam of the Sabbath, uh, 
Pope Sylvester decreed that Christians were to fast on the Sabbath. They were to not to partake of any food. How would you like to spend the Sabbath with an empty stomach? Eh? My children would be crying all the time. Mama, Papa, when is the Sabbath over so we can eat the pizza? Because my wife prepares you know, two big pizzas on Friday night. The Jews have the two loaves of bread to open the Sabbath, you know, the halot in remembrance of the double portion of the manna. We are not Jews, we are Italian, so we have the two pizzas, you follow me? And one of the pizzas is left over for Saturday night. And if they had to spend the whole Sabbath without food, they would be crying for the Sabbath to be over in order to get hold of that pizza. Now, liturgically, I found that Pope Innocent the first is the one that decreed that no religious assembly, no Lord's Supper was ever to be celebrated on the Sabbath. So as you can see, the Church of Rome used theological, social, liturgical method to promote the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. But the question is, why was Sunday? Why was the day of the sun chosen? And the answer is to be found in the influence of sun worship. You know, I found that sun worship became very popular in ancient Rome. There were two brands of sun worship, two types of sun worship. There was the native sun worship. Here is Apollo, the leading Roman god, portrayed as the sun god with this um, halo around his head, with all of the sun burst around his head. And this is right at the entrance of his temple of Apollo. Here is Apollo riding the quadriga chariot to, to the heaven. But then there was also so the foreign Persian sun uh, worship known as Mitraism, which was very popular in the army, among the magistrates, among the merchants. And so you have two blends, two types of sun worship that blended together. And the result was that the sun god eventually made the day of the sun the first and most important day of the week. I should explain to you something that may surprise you. Did you know that in the first century, the day of the sun was the second day of the week? You see, the, each day of the week was portrayed by the picture of the planetary god that controlled the day, because each day of the week was connected to a planetary god. Saturn, Dies Saturni, was the first day of the week. Dies Solis was the second day. That is in the first century. This is, by the way, from the public bath of Titus, 70 AD approximately. But when we come to the second century, what do we find? We find that the day of the sun was advanced from day number two to day number one. Was made the first and most important day of the week. And I found that this development influenced Christians to adopt this day of the sun in order for them to show separation from the Jews and identification with the Roman. So there are ample evidences of the influence of sun worship. I wish we had more time, but I will have to be very brief in sharing with you some of this information. You know, it's a very fascinating study to see the influence of sun worship in early Christianity. For example, you know what I found? I found there were church leaders like Tertullian, very influential church leader. He's regarded as the father of Latin Christianity. He rebukes the Christian for worshiping the sun especially on the day of the sun. That really shows how sun worship had become popular in those days. Churches were built oriented toward the sun, and Christians would pray toward sunrise because that was the practice of their pagan neighbors. And you know, one of the most interesting things, I wish I could take you to Rome. You know, I'm from Rome. One of these days, I think it would be nice to organize a trip to Italy and bring a bunch of you for a very special, personalized tour. I would be able to show you a lot of things that the typical guy doesn't know much about. But you know, in Rome, there are there are these Mitraic chapel, chapel to the sun god, about which there are Christian churches built on the same pattern, the same design. Let me mention, for example, the Church of St. Clement, one of the oldest churches. It goes back to the second century. And there is a Mitraic chapel uh, which is underground because the worship of the sun god uh, often was conducted in underground chapel because the sun god was, uh, this Mitra was the one, the god that conquered the darkness, the underground, and the triumph, so to speak, over the power of darkness and eventually ascended to heaven. And this is a very interesting Mitraic chapel. This is the altar that they used to worship 
the Mitra sent God over this altar. They had the bread and the wine like we have in the Lord's Supper because in this sun cult, there is a lot of similarity with Christianity. Blood played a very important role. Mitra was the Persian shepherd that, that, uh, that uh, killed the bull that was the symbol of darkness, of evil. And you can see here the snake trying to lick the blood and the idea was that there is power in the blood and so the blood of the bull was being sucked so to speak so that it would not exert its beneficial effect at any rate it's interesting to see uh, how churches were built over uh, the chapel that had been uh, constructed for the worship of the sun and what is interesting in that chapel that right on the spot where there is the altar to the sun god right above it there is the Catholic altar for the celebration of the Mass. It seems that in designing the Christian church, they wanted to be sure that there would be an accurate correspondence between the two. And it's interesting to notice that even the birth of the Son God was celebrated on December 25th. And this, this is the birth of the Son God out of the cosmic egg as, as it is portrayed. And Christians adopted the birth of the Son God to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Christ. One of the most impressive similarities is in the iconography of Christ, in the pictorial representation of Christ. Careful now, this is very interesting. I made a trip to Rome to take a good shot of this picture. This is a recent excavation that was done in the St. Peter Cathedral under the confession of, of, of St. Peter where, the, where Christ is portrayed as the sun god. You see two horses here, this is Christ with a halo and the seven shafts around this. Is a, and you look here at the picture of the sun god. The sun god with the quadriga chariot, you know, ascending to heaven. And in the earliest pictorial representation of Christ, which has come down to us from early Christian antiquity, Christ is portrayed as the sun god, ascending into the heaven like a sun god on the quadriga chariot. It's very interesting, isn't it? I, I, I like to explain this with picture because then you can know what I used to give this with words but with the help of picture I can help you to understand what we are talking about another interesting evidence of sun worship is the sun burst this was always used in pagan sun worship to portray the power of the sun god to defeat and overcome darkness and the evil the evil god you can see how they are all chased away and you know where you find this right there in St. Peter, right above the throne of St. Peter, there is this very impressive sunburst. And you can see how the influence of sun worship is right there in the St. Peter Cathedral or Basilica, which is the mother church of the Catholic Church. And you will see how the sunburst is used in the iconography, in the portrayal of all the saints of Jesus. Do you notice always there is a sunburst, a halo? And notice here the heart of Jesus with the sunburst. Everything has a sunburst because that was the symbol of the, of the sun worship, of the power of the sun god that is being attributed, you know, to Christian saints and Madonnas and Christ. And another interesting thing, this is a utensil that was used for the worship of the sun god. And you know what? It's called the ostensorium. And that has been adopted by the Catholic Church for the celebration of the Mass. There is a point during the celebration of the Mass where the priest elevates the host. Inside here, there is the host, the wafer, and during the consecration of the wafer, they use the ostensorium. This utensil of sun worship is used today in the celebration of the Mass. More directly, we see how Christians appeal to the creation of the light to justify Sunday observer. Jerome, for example, says, if it is called the day of the sun by the pagan, we, mo we are willingly acknowledge it as such. Why? Since it was on this day that the light of the world appeared, and on this day the sun of justice arose. 
Well, in conclusion, we have seen that the change from Sabbath to Sunday came about not by the authority of Christ, not by the authority of the apostle, not because of the desire to honor the resurrection of Jesus, but because of social, political, pagan, and religious factor. We found how anti-Judaism influenced the abandonment of the Sabbath, how pagan sun worship influenced the adoption of Sunday, and how various bishops of Rome, you know, promoted various measures to lead Christians away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. The change was not just a change of names, of number, but was a change of meaning, authority, and experience. It was a change motivated by expediency, the desire to avoid a repressive anti-Sabbath legislation. Indeed, it was a change from Christian commitment to Christian compromise. In closing, I'd like to remind us of the witness of the Apostle Paul, the man who chose not to compromise. He came to Rome as a prisoner, walking here on the Appian Way, where I have taken tourists many times. He came to Rome not as a tourist. He came to Rome as a prisoner because he was not prepared to compromise his faith. He was placed in a dark, damp jail known as the Mamertine prison. And from this prison cell, the Apostle Paul wrote some of the most beautiful pastoral letters, my preferite letters of the New Testament. And I would like to leave with you a statement, a statement that is very meaningful to me, and I hope it will be meaningful to all of us, where Paul says there in 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7, I'm on the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I kept the faith. I like that. I kept the faith. Many things he couldn't keep. He couldn't keep the coat. He couldn't keep the books too heavy to carry, but he kept the faith. My fervent hope and prayer for each one of us that at the end of our Christian pilgrimage, we, like Paul, might say, I have kept the faith. And honoring the Savior on the Sabbath is a very meaningful, tangible way to keep our faith and express our faith, loving commitment to our Savior. This is my prayer for each one of us today. Let us pray. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us the opportunity this morning to review how thy holy day was changed from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. We have been reminded how often Christians have chosen compromise rather than commitment to the teaching of thy word. We will pray that, like Paul, we might keep the faith to the very end, that we may be willing to stand for what we know to be true. And may the Sabbath become for us the badge of our faith, of our commitment, of our love to thee, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.